as we read chapter 4, verses 35 down to 41. And after we pray, my daughter is going to come and going to play. Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 down to 41. Bible says, And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him, even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. I underlined that little phrase there, other little ships. And there were also great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so faithful, or fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? I want to preach to you this morning, what to do when the storm comes. I wish our lives were peaceful 24-7, 365 days. Unfortunately, that's not how it's going to go. Storms are going to come. But as Christians, when the storms come, how do we handle it? How do we face it? What do we do? Of course, we can learn a few principles out of the Bible this morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for the Bible. I often say, Bible is one of the most precious gifts that he has given to us. I know that there are millions of people out there who would like to have a page out of this Bible in their hands so that they can read and they can meditate. You have graciously given us the Bible that we can read, study, hold it in our hands this morning. We love you. We thank you for that. As we look at your word, Please speak to our hearts. Lord, I pray for the pastor. Please touch him, dear God. Uh, bring him back and uh, heal him, dear God, and protect his family. Thank you for this dear church. Give us a good time, dear God. Let's worship you. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Please be seated.
Mark chapter 4, Jesus Christ is dealing with his disciples and teaching them. When you read chapter 4, you see that Jesus Christ is teaching to them, teaching the disciples about the sower, the reason of the parables in chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. Parable of the sower is explained further in chapter 4, verses 13 down to 20. And the lamp is explained in chapter 4, verses 21 down to 25. The seed, which is the kingdom, is explained in chapter 4, verses 26 through 29. And the mustard seed, finally, is explained in chapter 4, verses 30 to 34. All of that teaching is happening, but it looks like the disciples are not getting it. When you look at chapter 4, verse 12, it is clearly understood. The disciples are sitting at the master teacher, perhaps Jesus Christ. But it is not going to their brain. You know, it is possible for us to sit in a church, you know, sit under the sound preaching, maybe in a class. Sometimes it just goes over our head. That's the situation that is happening to the disciples. So Jesus Christ, who understands everything, he tells the disciples, let's get into the boat and go over to the other side. I think he's trying to take a break. You know, at the heart of the day, teaching is not happening very well. The students are not paying attention. You know, Jesus Christ is like, okay, come on, guys, let's take a break. So they go into a boat, and they're going to enjoy a little bit of time, I'm assuming, in the Sea of Galilee. Sea of Galilee, it's not a, it's an ocean, it's, it's a large lake, really large lake. That's the reason it is called the Sea of Galilee. It is big enough that it can even produce some storms, unexpected storms and waves and stuff like that. So while they are in this boat, this incident that we read in chapter 4 is happening. All of a sudden, the huge waves are coming, wind and the thunderstorm is coming, and the boats are, uh, are about to go under. And the Bible says Jesus Christ was sleeping in the boat, and the disciples got scared. You know, it's amazing that Jesus could sleep in that, you know, peaceful. Because he is son of God. He is the one in control. Sea of Galilee, this particular lake is well known for this unexpected storm to come. You know, Christian life, I'm not trying to spiritualize, but taking a principle. Christian life is much like that, Sea of Galilee. Everything on the surface, it may look like going smooth. No problems. All of the sudden... An unexpected storm can come your way and my way. I mean, look at the world today. Everyone is under stress. If you, you know, no one was thinking about this thing when, you know, when the new year came around. I can't believe that we were just wishing happy new year for this. You know, I don't think anyone expected this. But guess what? Churches are struggling. Families are struggling. Businesses are struggling. A lot of those uncertainties and the fears and anxieties going through the minds of even some good Christians. And if you're not careful, you will become so negative and so bitter and looking at God and say, God, I didn't sign up for this. Give me a different one. That doesn't work that way. But the only thing you can do is when the storm comes, prepare and have a right attitude to go through the storm. Prepare your mind and prepare your heart and go through the storm. Why? Because Jesus Christ, the master of everything, he is with you in the boat. All you need to do is just sit still. The Bible says, peace be still. He wants us to sit still and go through the storm and he got it. Sickness. Doctors report that it's not that pleasant. Marriage problems. A rebellious child at home. Death in the family. Financial struggles. Health concerns. A lot of unexpected things can come your way and my way, what I call the wind or the storms like what we see in the Sea of Galilee. You know, I wish the life was always peaceful, calm, no problems. John chapter 16, verse 33. Bible is very clear about these things, dear friend. Let's look at it. John chapter 16, verse 33. Bible says, These things have I written unto you, 
that, that in me you might have peace. The next phrase is very important. In this world, ye shall have tribulation. You know, a lot of the TV preachers, I'm not really a big fan of them. As a matter of fact, you know, I criticize them pretty, pretty heavily. You never see any of these smiling TV preachers quoting that verse. Have you ever? But churches like ours who preach the truth, we have to tell you the truth. Guess what? When you go through the struggles of life, it is part of life because the Bible says in this world, you and I, we are going to have the tribulation. Hurricane Katrina in 2005. No one expected it. Everyone thought it's just going to be a big storm and, you know, a couple of days and it's going to be over. Nope. $81 billion in property damage. $81 billion, not million, billion. Just in the Mississippi alone. The total expense of Hurricane, Hurricane Katrina, $150 billion. You know, there are still some communities still struggling to, to, to survive from that hurricane that happened in 2005. Almost 2,000, 3,000 people died. No one expected such a storm. No one. So sometimes things like that, situations like that can come to your way and my way. There are many forms of storms that come your way. What can I do when I go through the storms? One may say, you sound like a very pessimist person. Why can't you be optimistic? No, dear friend, I'm a realist. Because the Bible clearly says, in this world, you shall have tribulation. It is. So, what can we do when you go through the troubles of the life? Number one, when you go through the storm, remember who called you into the boat, what I call the Christian life. Who is the reason why are you a Christian? Or who is the reason that you are a Christian today? I hope it is Jesus Christ. If you are a Christian apart from Christ, I will have to doubt your Christianity. Mark chapter 4 verse 35, Bible says, And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. Who is this he? Jesus Christ. So they go into the boat because Jesus called them into the boat. You know, there are a lot of Christians today. They name the name Christians, and they have nothing to do with Christ. That's the reason we preach the gospel very clearly. You become a Christian, not because your grandpa was a Christian or because your mama was a Christian. No, we don't become Christian like that. You become Christian because you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. There's no other way. Luke chapter 8, verse 22. Bible says, he said unto them, let us go over to the other side. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. Bible says, whereunto he called you by our gospel. The calling is done by Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Bible says, Who hath called you out of darkness? What I'm trying to say is that if you are a Christian, I hope it is because you put your trust in Jesus Christ. There is no other way to become a Christian. Let me ask you this. Who is this Jesus to you this morning? Who is this Jesus? What is your relationship with this person that we call Jesus Christ? Is he one of those pictures on your wall? Or is, you know, in some homes, he might be a statue. Is that kind of relationship that you have? If you ask me, who is this Jesus to me? I have to tell you, he is my savior. He is my Lord. He is my sacrifice. He is my shepherd. He is the crucified one. He is the almighty. He is the everlasting God. He is the prince of peace. He is my companion. He is my close friend. 
He's my precious lamb. He's the lily of the valley. He's the morning star. He's the king of kings. He's the eternal son of God. He's the joy giver. He's my true friend. He my, he's my direction in my life. He's my trust in my life. He's my chief cornerstone. Above all, he's the king of kings and lord of lords. If you have him in your life, anything less than that, you need to go back and check your relationship with Jesus Christ. In other words, you and I, we are Christians because Jesus Christ offered that great invitation that you see in John 3, 16, whosoever. Dear friends, Jesus is the reason why we are Christians. And he called you into this great board, what we call the Christian life, for salvation and the fellowship with him. Is this the person that made the call into your life? And if it's so, do you doubt his power? Do you doubt his wisdom? Do you doubt his truthfulness to you? Do you think he's going to abandon you halfway through the race? No, 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 dear friends. If Jesus Christ is the one that made you to get into this boat, he's going to hold your hand until the storm is going to pass through. No doubt. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24. The Bible says, Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. My question, I guess, this morning is, how certain are you about your salvation? I'm glad you're here. You come to church, especially during this COVID era thing and everything. That's, that's commendable. But let me tell you, this is not going to get you to heaven. The only thing that can take you to heaven is the question that you're going to answer. Am I washed by the blood of Jesus Christ? And if you haven't accepted him as your personal savior, you haven't washed by the blood of Jesus Christ at the feet of foothills of the Calvary, dear friend, you and I, we are not going to make it into heaven. Are you called by this Jesus? Number two, when you go through the storm, remember the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. Look at chapter 4, verse 36. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him, even as he was in the ship. In the ship. Matthew chapter 8, verse 23 talks about the same thing. Luke chapter 8, 22. There are many teachings in the world today. One of the teachings is called the deism. Deism is the teaching that, similar to what we see, God created this great universe. God created you and I and everything that you see and don't see. According to deism, after he created this great creation, he is no longer interested in his creation. And therefore, he keeps the distance. He's, he doesn't care much about what's going on in the world today, supposedly according to this teaching. And he has no personal connection or relationship with his creation. In other words, according to deism, you and I... We are nowhere in his radar. According to deism, he happened to create us. Then after that, he lost his interest in his creation. And he stands far off somewhere in the ether. And he watches you and I through as we go through the life. What does the Bible say about that? Joshua chapter 1 verse 9. The last part of that verse says, For the Lord thy God... Is with thee. Whithersoever thou goest. In other words, deism says God created you, this supposedly God, and he is far away. There is a great distance between him and you as the creation. But the Bible says in Joshua that he is with you and I. Hmm. That means when you go through the storm, he's right there. He's right there. I don't know what kind of situation you're going through this morning. Struggles of life. Who can count? Different shapes, different colors. I wish we could understand the pain some people go through. The heartaches that go through. One of the greatest 
fears that people often have is the fear of loneliness. You know, you go through the situation. You know, you had to a certain point in your life, you had a lot of people in your, in your, in, in your life, your husband, your wife, as you get a little bit older, you know, children start leaving home and, and all of a sudden you're lonely and you think that, dear God, this is so tough. I'm all alone. There is nobody to lean on. There is nobody to share my burden. Let me encourage you this morning. When you go through the storm, Jesus Christ is with you. Please understand. You can have thousands of people around you. If you don't have Jesus with you, you aren't going to be lonely. It will be better if you can establish that relationship with him just like this. So Bible says, number one, remember who called you into the boat. Number two, remember that he is with you in the boat as you go through the storm. Thank God for the Matthew chapter 28, verse number 20. I am with you. By the way, these are promises of the Bible. It's not, it's not just for us to read, but it is for us to read, to understand, and to claim it. Meaning, claim it as my, for, my, for me. Psalms 23, verse number 4. The Bible says, for thou art with me. What a comfort. I don't care what kind of storm you're going through. Remember, if you are a born-again believer, if you're washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, remember who called you into the boat. Don't forget that. Remember that same Jesus that saved you is with you as you go through the storm. Number three, know that, that there are other people with you as you go through the storm. There are other people with you as you go through the storm. Let's look at verse number 36. The last phrase there, I asked you, to, I, I said I underlined that phrase in my Bible. It says, and there were also with him, what does that say? Other little ships. It's amazing, you know, Bible has these little bitty phrases in there. Sometimes we just read through them and we just miss it. When we go through the storm, it's the time Satan would like us to whisper to us more. He often calls doubts and cause fear, bring thoughts of false security often in our minds. This is when we want to be left. Have you noticed that? If you have raised any teenagers, when they get upset, what do they do? They run to the room, shut the door. The last phrase you will hear is that, leave me alone, right? Leave me alone. You know that they're not on their knees praying for you when they're alone in that room. They're angry. They're upset. Leave me alone. We have to be very careful. You know, when you are alone, you make a great audience to Satan. We you notice that? Read the Bible. Study the Bible. A lot of these guys that have been alone, and the girls, when they were sitting alone, they made a great audience to Satan. Starting from the Garden of Eden, by the way. Eve was alone, and Satan made a great audience out of her. A lot of times, that's the time Satan tricks you to, to, to listen to him. Satan has a way of talking to us right in our ears. So when you go through the storm, you have to make sure that you're not going to be alone giving a great audience to Satan. Let me, let me look at this passage here. The Bible says this great storm came through. Jesus and his disciples were in one boat. You can imagine that must have been a bigger one because the Bible says the other ones were little ones, the smaller ones. Let me ask you, who got the brunt of the storm? The big boat or the small one? The smaller ones, the little ones. But you only read about the big boat. The question is, what happened to those little ones? 
When I go through the storm and I have a problem in my life, all I can think about is me and my issues. That's how we are. We're human beings. It's very seldom that we think about the little boats that we have around us. You are going through a financial problem this morning. You know what? Your issue is a big issue. I understand. You are faced with some situations in your life. Let me, let me, let me tell you, your problems that you are looking at, is, it, it, it's a big situation. I understand. But do you know there are other people around you, perhaps in this church, maybe in this community, that are going through the same situation just like these other little ships. Other little ships. You know, when the storm came through, these little ships, they were looking at the big one. And I'm sure their heart is raising because the big ones look like they're about to go down. The little ships, the only hope that they have is that we will be okay as long as the big one doesn't go down. Those big ones are us, the Christians. When the storm comes, we are the first one to jump out of the boat, oftentimes. What happened to your faith? What happened to your trust? What happened to your belief in that you are going to hold on to Jesus? You forgot all of that. I forgot all of that. And I will be the first one to say, it is enough. Let's jump out of this boat and let's see if we can make it. A lot of times we don't. Stay in the boat. The other little ships are looking to see how you and I make it through the storm. Because they know that if, if they can make it, we will be okay. If something happens, those big boys that are around us, they're going to come and lend us a hand and they will help us. Dear friends, when you go through the storm, be very careful. You don't have to isolate yourself. You don't have to think that I'm all alone. There is nobody to see me. No, there are other little ships around you. Don't give Satan a great audience when you go through the trouble. You know, that's the time Satan wants to whisper into your ears. You're about to go down. You're about to go down. You are useless. There is no purpose in your life. Just give it up and just, just cast yourself at my feet. That's the time Satan doesn't want you to read the Bible. That's the time Satan doesn't want you to sing the old hymns. That's the time Satan doesn't want you to go to church. That's the time Satan doesn't want you to go to the soul winning. Dear friends, when you go through the storm, when you have the difficult times in your life, I believe that's the time you need to read more Bible. That's the time you need to sing the old hymns. That's the time you need to come to church more often than normal. Because you need people around you. He who feels isolated can be defeated very easily. A great general said once, you don't have to be isolated in yourself. But turn around, you can help somebody. The other little ships around you, they need you. They're just looking at you and see if you will be okay so you can help them. Remember, there are other little ships, other people that are going through the similar situation. Number four, don't blame Jesus for our storms. Chapter 4, verse 38. The disciples finally woke Jesus up and saying to him, the last phrase there in verse number 38, part of the verse, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Sounds like an innocent question, don't you? But they forgot that who they are talking to. They are talking to Jesus Christ, the Son of God who created this whole universe. And they have the courage, if you would, they have the audacity to ask him the question, don't you care that we are about to perish? I think that question had a negative connotation there. In other words, they are looking at Jesus Christ sleeping sound and they are looking at him. How can you sleep like that when we are about to perish? In other words, get up and do something for us. There's a little bit of an accusation there. 
I've seen Christians doing that. They go through the life situation. And all of a sudden they turn against God and say, no, God, you said you're going to deliver me. You said you're going to take care of me. I think it's because of you that I'm going through the situation. And they become very bitter and they become very angry and they become very upset. James chapter 1 verse 13, Bible says, let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. While God isn't and cannot actually tempt anyone to sin, he can and he does allow us to be tempted with situations to prove our sin and also our trust in him. For example, Job in the Bible. He went through all of that, not because he was a sinful man. He went through all of that to see, to show him, him how much he loved the Lord and how much he trusted the Lord. So when you go through the struggles of life, don't blame Jesus. A lot of times it's my own bringing. Other times he's trying to prove uh, for me to see my trust in him. For the other little chips around me to see how much I trust in him. We have no business blaming Jesus for our struggles. Number five and final, when called upon Jesus, he shows up right on time. When called upon Jesus, he shows up right on time. I don't know about you, but we have a time called Indian time. It's the time from India, that means two hours behind the clock. If you said eight o'clock, expect him to show up around 10 o'clock. I, I always struggled with that. I grew up in a military home. My dad was in the Indian Army. So when he said eight o'clock, he meant 7.45. You know, 7.50, you're late. So we have an Indian time, you know, generally what, was, what we say. Isn't that amazing? Jesus doesn't have... Indian time. I thank God for that. When he said he's going to show up at 8 o'clock, you can mark his word, he will be there. Here the disciples got scared and they're afraid. They think that they're about to go down. But they cry unto Jesus saying, please come help. Guess what? Right there on time. Remember when Apostle Peter was drowning? He cried. Jesus was right there. Remember in Luke chapter 7, there was a, as a, there was a widow in the city of uh, Nain called, she had one son, and he passed away, and they were about to carry him to the cemetery, and here comes Jesus. And he stops the procession and says, hey, let me see the, the, the coffin. And the Bible says he actually touched the coffin and made the boy alive. I have to think about that, you know, the next morning when that mother was preparing breakfast for the boy. She's looking at his eyes. And I can, I, I can think that he, she's going to sh share the story with him. Son, yesterday this time, we were carrying you to the cemetery. And I can see the boy saying, what happened? Well, you got sick and you passed away and we had, a, we, 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 we had you in a coffin and we were literally carrying you to the cemetery. A few hours into it, we would have buried you. Then he, the boy is like, oh, then what happened? I can see that mom crying. The only boy that has, she has, only child. I can see her telling him the story. There was a man named Jesus. He came through our town. I can see boys and did it. Who called him? Mom says, I didn't call him. Nobody called him. He just came right on time and he touched your coffin and you're alive. Dear friends, are you going through the storms? He is able to come for you right on time. Not a minute early, not a minute late. You must have been praying for some things. Maybe you're looking at a situation in your life and say, Dear God, this is a little too much. I need your help. I do need your help for me to go through the storm. The uncertainties that I see in the world, sometimes it makes me so, 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 uh, the anxiety comes into my mind and, and I'm scared. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. The financial situation, my family, my children, a lot of things on me that I am worried about. Let me encourage you. 
Remember who called you into the boat. My Savior, Jesus Christ. Remember who is with you in the boat. Jesus Christ. Number three, remember, you're not the only one. There are other people going through the situations just like you. Other little ships. Number four, don't blame Jesus for your storms. He may bring the storm in your life for a purpose. Finally, trust. When you call upon him, he's going to show up right on time and deliver you. Would you look up to him this morning? Every eyes closed, heads bow down. I want to ask two questions this morning. First and foremost, my question is, are you saved? What do I mean by that? What do I mean by that is, have you accepted Jesus Christ?